kind of kick us off with the slides and the recording. So as a reminder, we are recording today's meeting. We've muted everyone but our guests today and until we get to the Q&A. If we have time, we'll, we'll try to allow time for some Q&A, which can be submitted in the chat or we might even be willing to unmute some people if you'd like to, like to um, ask us things. So at the conclusion of our time together, you know, we'll, um, we'll share where you can find any resources that we've included or mentioned during the recording. And of course, there are recordings of our previous sessions. Um, in January on the 14th, I facilitated a Grow PA gathering where we just scratched the surface of what we know about broadband in Pennsylvania. I left that meeting wanting to know more. Three weeks ago, we met with Sasha Meinrith and Harry Chrissy to learn more about the and uh, Sasha's our guest today as well, um, on mapping broadband across the Commonwealth. Uh, our idea was to have a better understanding of what we know, so we know where to head from here. Um, as we know that, we can decide you know, where we need to, to provide more, better, faster, affordable broadband. So today, I'm really happy to bring Sasha back with us. He's joined by Jill Foyes. Sasha Meinrith is the Palmer Chair in Telecommunications at Penn State and the Director of the XLab, an innovative think tank focusing on the intersection of vanguard technologies and public policy. Professor Meinrith is a renowned technology policy expert and is internationally recognized for his work over the past two decades as a community internet pioneer, social entrepreneur, and angel investor. Jill Foyce is the executive director of the Northwest Commission, a public nonprofit resource for economic and business development, as well as community development and planning services, serving eight counties in Northwestern Pennsylvania, including Clarion, Crawford, Erie, Forest, Lawrence, Mercer, Venango, and Warren counties. So with that, we're gonna get started. Uh, thank you both for joining me today. Um, so, uh, you know, a typical question is, where's the money? Show me the money. <laughs> so when we look at solving questions with broadband, it can be really easy to go right to, but who's going to pay for it? So um, let's delve in a little bit and see what we can learn. So Jill, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by directing this to you. Can you tell us a little bit about how public broadband is typically funded? You know, whose responsibility is it to build out the infrastructure of broadband sure. in our communities? Thank you, Susan, for having both of us today. We appreciate the uh, the time to discuss. Um, it's an interesting time in broadband. Um, for the first time ever, I think um, in 2020 and 2021, we have had funding at all levels, local, state, and federal. So it's a, it's it's interesting. And I just want to kind of touch on some of those funding sources that we've been involved in, as well as some of them that are available. So. Um, uh, from, a, from a federal level, there are several different agencies that are funding uh, broadband, um, either currently or proposed. Um, we do know that in the, uh, in the Rescue Bill Act that's, that's going through the federal government right now, there is a lot of opportunity for broadband and infrastructure funding. Um, so, you know, I sat in on a presentation yesterday on all the what ifs and the could be's. Um, so we won't dive too deep into that because it's speculation at this point, but it's nice to know that there are options. Um, and so some of those that, that we've been involved in or that we've written the letters of support for here in Northwest Pennsylvania on the federal level, um, one of the most popular is the ARC Power Grant, the Appalachian Regional Commission. Their letter of intent deadline was due for this year's funding this past Friday, and we do know that North, there are counties within Northwest Pennsylvania that have taken advantage of that, um, and uh, so um, projects, and there's a set aside within power of $15 million specific to broadband, so we have a couple counties who are taking advantage of that doing those, um, those fixed wireless projects or even fiber development. So we're seeing more and more of that. Um, USDA, the Department of Agriculture, has a couple different programs. Um, the Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant, and we've, had, we've been partnering with some who have taken advantage of that in Warren County that will serve Warren and, and Crawford, um, Youngsville TV, which is a 501c12 which is, um, which is a uh, co-op, which is traditionally a, an electric co-op, but they're actually a television co-op, doing some really interesting things with fiber development and fixed wireless as well. So they've been, they've been um, 
successful applicants from the Power Grant as well as um, distance learning. And the third that I would mention, they're kind of the poster child when we talk about public uh, funding for broadband, uh, the ReConnect program. They've been, they've been successful in that as well. So the Northwest Commission has been working with them as well. Um, one of the really interesting projects that we have in the power application is working with um, volunteer fire departments in both Warren and Crawford County, running fiber to those areas. Because no matter how small your community is, you probably have a volunteer fire department, right? So we're running fiber to those locations and then fixed wireless to light up the community. So really some out of the box thinking as far as how to get connectivity to these really underserved and rural areas. So um, power has been, has been the uh, benefactor of that as well. Um, you know, this year, like I mentioned, the, the, the locals have gotten involved. Um, many of our counties used some of their CARES Act money, which again, federal money, but passed through the state and to the local level. Some of them took advantage of that, those dollars and are doing, uh, again, traditionally fixed wireless to use those CARES Act dollars um, to, to provide connectivity. And then at the Commonwealth level, we've been fortunate, the local development districts, which is what the Northwest Commission is, there's seven of us throughout the state, um, working with the uh, Republican caucuses, both on the Senate and House side, we've set aside, they've set aside for us um, $600,000 last year and this year to do some pilot projects. And what's great about state dollars, can, the Commonwealth dollars, we can use those as match to some of these federal programs. So we were actually able to tap into two different programs at ARC, the Appalachian Regional Commission, on the area development side of things, as well as the power to use their dollars, the state's dollars to double the investment. So we have lots of projects on the local level in all of the 52, not all of the, um, in the 52 county region of Appalachia here in Pennsylvania, but um, projects that we're developing and, and putting together right now. Great, well, that's a lot of information. We're gonna delve into that a little bit more, but let's, uh, Sasha, as you hear what Jill is describing, is that pretty consistently what you see across the state or those you know typical funding solutions um, and or, or and or do you see some differences in how that plays out? Um, you know, what, what else might there be that we may not be including in all of that? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot. And I, I, you know, I wanna point out, I'm still waiting for the state of Pennsylvania to really take a jump into this area. And in particular, there is a growing array of federal funding sources that would benefit greatly from local matching funds you know, due diligence on the front and kind of getting a bunch of projects to the point where they would be, if not eligible, very much more ready for accepting of federal funds. And thus far, the state has really shied away from making a meaningful intervention in this space. So I'm going to start by saying we have a lot more that we need to be doing at the state level. We've talked about it for years, and I want to applaud the folks that have been leading those efforts, but we still haven't actually gotten to the interventions. And that's a challenge, I think, for this state legislature in 2021 to really dig in and get some funding out the door to interested parties, municipalities, et cetera, uh, that want to get ready for what is, yeah, a huge array of different federal funding sources. So in addition to the ones that Jill just raised, and I think those are really great because these these regional uh, funders have a much less contended portfolio, right? A lot of these federal funds are incredibly contentious to apply for, mm -hmm. which is to say maybe one out of every 10 projects gets funded. Um, and there's a whole bunch more of these sort of smaller scale niche programs. And by smaller scale, I mean, you know, millions to tens of millions, occasionally hundreds of millions. Uh, that is small by federal standards. And there's a couple of really large federal programs as well. So the Rural Digital Opportunities Fund uh, just had its first phase. Uh, that was supposed to be the big phase, but it actually ended up being smaller than anticipated. They only spent $9 billion on broadband build out projects across the country. Uh, they have a $20 billion pot, which you know most of us can do that math and realize we've got about $11 billion still to spend. 
that's going to be spent down over this year, right? We, or I should say allocated over this year. And that will be for projects spanning the next decade. And this is important because these aren't slow broadband projects. These are for the most part going to be broadband projects in the 100 megabit per second and up category, which in essence is going to mean like mostly fiber and next generation infrastructure build out. So for a lot of communities, this is a huge pot of money that is coming available uh, very, very quickly. Now, there's also a, a whole multi-billion, I think it's a little about $3.2 billion in this emergency broadband benefit that will be available between like now and maybe a year from now, maybe not even that long, which is a direct subsidy to providers. And the, the FCC has taken a very open uh, assessment of what a provider of broadband services is. Even if you haven't registered as what's called an eligible telecommunications carrier, you may still be eligible to get these subsidies that break down to $50 per household to, to pay a portion of your monthly rate to that house, which is to say, this is something that we need to let households know because a lot of people, if you are poor, if you receive a Pell Grant, if your income streams have been disrupted by COVID, like you may very well be eligible for a $50 a month free you know, subsidy from the federal government to pay to your provider of choice. That kind of free money doesn't come around very often and it's only here for this moment in time. So that's the EBB program, the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program. And it's nationwide. They're going to spend down the money until they have none left. It'll be shocking how quickly we burn through $3.2 billion in that regard. And then there's a whole bunch of other additional funds that are coming in. There's a billion dollars for tribes. Not that that helps us here in Pennsylvania. Uh, but there's also these chunks of money for telemedicine, for uh, um, uh, what do they call them? For minority communities, for uh, HBCUs, historically black universities and colleges, uh, those sorts of entities all tucked into the last coronavirus response bill that got passed. And there's a whole bunch more tucked into the current one that's you know imminent at this point in time a bunch of different programs for broadband build out, for subsidies to different programs, for specific projects or programs that are affecting telemedicine, telehealth, teleeducation, all of these different sectors. And um, we'll be seeing a lot more once the dust settles from the current deliberations and this thing you know, gets signed. But in essence, people should be ready for a series of different efforts um, unfortunately, not very well coordinated, but beyond that, it's very likely that many communities, especially if you're serving rural communities, that you will be eligible for one or more of these pots of funding. And you know that, it sounds to me like um, boy, more than one full-time job could be spent just exploring where there's where there's funding sitting out there. We've got the, the ones that Jill's always going to hear about and kind yep. of know about through her network. And then maybe, um, which, which I know Jill's organization, she's got a great staff, but they're doing a lot. So anybody yeah. that can be helpful at identifying this stuff, the, the goal is to not leave any money sitting on the table, right? Yeah, and NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, uh, has a pretty good compendium of at least a few hundred of these different opportunities. You can search it by state, by constituency, and um, it may not, I don't know if it's still being updated, but it was updated through the fall of last year, and that is a good place to start because there are, again, all these niche programs that uh, nobody even knows exists. They aren't getting the headlines like a $3 billion program might, but that a lot of our communities here in Pennsylvania are very much eligible for. And so starting there is a great place to begin sleuthing out what's available.
Great. We, we'd love to, you know, make sure that we have that reference and that we can put that out there for people that want to dig in. I had kind of said at the, in the, the, my first question to Jill, we didn't quite get to, but whose responsibility it is to build infrastructure? Who's responsible? So I, I'm going to say that's a little rhetorical, right? It's, it's everybody's responsibility because would I, would it be true to say that in order to really fully utilize funding, there, there may be those who, by nature of their organization or program, qualify, but, but we need to really consider everyone from household to organization to, you know, our, our nonprofits and service community, everyone should be looking for where they can, can tap into appropriate funding and better yet if we can all coordinate that. Yeah, and I would say there's this really nice interplay, right? That you do need all these different levels coordinating efforts, but what different levels of government are funding are, I think, very different, which is to say the federal government is very likely the best funder for large-scale infrastructure projects. And that is because it can collectivize like the collection of say universal service fund fees across the whole country and then devote those to where universal service is lacking. Um, but at the state, especially, and even at the local level, that due diligence, that front end work to get ready and to support the application for these large scale projects is also desperately needed. And frankly, that's where at the moment, Pennsylvania is pretty behind the curve. Well, and a number of states have really invested in this in a way that we have yet to do. Yeah, let's go back to Jill for a minute and talk talk about that. Some of the challenges of tapping into this funding, you know, I'm, I'm imagining that they're everything from, um, you know, kind of having shovel ready projects and, you know, having all those qualifiers. But Jill, can you talk to us about when when these new funding opportunities show up or when there's even existing? What are some of the challenges that come about? You know, when we laymen out here just think, oh, there's all kinds of money. You should be building out our broadband, but it's not that easy, right? Can you tell us? Yeah, you're absolutely like? right. Um, you know, and, and Sasha touched on some and even in your question, you know, you talked about, um, you know, what were some of those challenges? It is, you know, shovel ready. Shovel ready is tough. There's a lot of due diligence. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. And that's one of the things that the commission has been working on for about the last year, working with um, our consultants, HRG, to start mapping and layering um, and identifying where are those projects and putting all of those layers together to see those areas of development those, you know, what can we do right now? They're not part of the RDOF or they are part of the RDOF, but they're, they're way off. And they are areas that have, um, you know, homes or businesses that are occupied. Um, understanding at a very granular level. Um, some of our counties are very, very rural. So it's important to know how many of these are full-time residents, how many of them are three months out of the year camps. Mm -hmm. um, where should we be focusing on that? So making sure that we have good inventory of, of um, municipalities and areas that we know need the, need the infrastructure that don't have the infrastructure and there isn't Eminent, gro eminent growth of, of or or a project that's that's about to take place, so that when these projects come up and you have a window of forty five days to put something together, you have something teed up and ready to go. Huge part of it. The other part is match. You know, we talked about how important match is. Um, very rarely are you going to get a project or a program out of the federal level that allows you to do 100% of the project. Um, you're going, and some of them are based and everyone has their own way of doing things. Some of it, it's a 50-50, it's a one-to-one it's -one match. Some of them are based on population. Some of them are based on, you know, um, ARC, the Appalachian Regional Commission. I always say it's like your credit score. You're not sure exactly what that formula is, but um, you know, seven of our eight counties here in the Northwest, it's a one-to-one -one match. Forest County, because they're considered distressed and there's a lot of things that go into that. Um, distressed for ARC means that economic, from an economic vitality perspective, you're in the lower, the, least, the lowest 10% of all counties in the country. And therefore their project match is 80-20. Um, there are 
places like Allegheny County and Elk County for a couple years, that was just the opposite. They were considered competitive, which means to get 20% of ARC funding, you had to put up 80% of the project. So, and just understanding all of those things. So that's where things get really get complex is understanding all of those things, having shovel ready projects, having the match in place, being able to match the match. Um, and I, what I mean by that is, you know, and, and one of the things we've run into is a county may be putting up a tower and they want to use that tower as match to some ARC funding or to some EDA funding or whatever the case may be. But, you know, those things have to take place at the same time. Mm -hmm. The construction of the, of the tower has to be at the same time of the construction of the fiber or the placing of equipment. So it's, it's not easy. It's not mm -hmm. simple. And so, and, and to your point, you almost have to have someone who's, who's watching all the balls being juggled. And as soon as you do that, then, then the game changes or you throw in, in a new project or, you know, so, so it, is, it is not easy. You're absolutely right. You know, sometimes we read headlines in the newspaper that say new funding source and we assume that it's magically going to appear. It doesn't happen that way. Um, you have to have a lot of people on your team watching a lot of those balls in the air and making sure that none of them drop. Yeah, and your, your mention of the community, I know I've heard some of the debate over, yeah, do we, do we look at our um, river communities here in rural Pennsylvania? Those are important to us. We wanna attract visitors and seasonal people. Um, so do we service them or do we look at our, our neighborhoods? And uh, well, it's all starting to look the same, right? Um, the, the reality is some of those vacation river properties now have people that are coming and living there and working remotely that could become full-time residents or business owners. So um, the, it, it's getting a little harder to know where, you know, where dollars should be. And it may not be that clear because of where they're available. Let's talk about collaboration a little bit um, because I, it sounds like everything you're saying is collaboration is important. Um, what are some of the collaborations that we need to be like working on encouraging right away? Sasha, do you want to give us oh, your gosh. two cents first? I mean, so, you know, these, these multi-level collaborative groups tend to, tend to, score the most money because they can tap into the most different pots, right? So obviously having local uh, entities from the local communities, I think essential to this. It's, and that's just not often done by a lot of the larger scale internet service providers. This is something that we, you know, the underserved of rural Pennsylvania have, I think a leg up on. I would say, you know, getting that local buy-in also from the municipality, from the county, et cetera, is often extremely important. Uh, the reason being that one of the most valuable assets that you need access to to effectively deploy networks are rights of way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can spend a good lifetime or two uh, banging your head up against those bureaucracies if you don't have buy-in from the front end and again, I feel like this is an area that is often given short shrift uh, by internet service providers. In fact, at the federal level, uh, a lot of what they're trying to do, rather than actively engage with local communities is to get pre preemption of local control. That trend, I think, which is terrible, is also one that they're spending millions of dollars a year to forward and one way to route around all of that is to make sure that your collaboration, your group that's applying for funds already has that buy-in on the front end. And it's especially important if you are working with established providers, that one can develop a fairly mutually beneficial quid pro quo if from the front end you've laid out the parameters of what is and what is not acceptable. So one option, for example, which is that we are only granting rights of way access if you're guaranteeing a certain speed tier availability at a certain affordable rate. I don't know why more municipalities don't throw down the gauntlet in this way, but certainly what we've seen time and time again is sort of a second class um, of service being afforded to folks in rural communities. And that, that again can be 
and there's no silver bullet here, right? So it's not that this yeah. magically disappears, but it certainly can be addressed on the front end when you're building that initial co collaboration. And for the internet service providers, knowing that they have quick and easy right of way access if they meet these criteria from the get go allows them to make much more clear uh, assessments of what the costs of what is often a multi year fairly complicated build out. So again, to me, this is sort of the bare minimum that one should be looking at. And then beyond that, you know, because as Jill has mentioned, there's a lot of eligibility requirements necessitating both public private partnerships for some grant programs, but also um, co funding of infrastructure getting your your state representatives in the loop early on making sure they understand the importance of their involvement and making sure frankly that they understand the the opportunity cost of the lack of a pot of money from the state uh, is super important as well i think that the wind is at our sails on this right i what, what i'm hearing talking to state representatives again and again on both sides of the aisle is that broadband is front and center on their radars i think it would be even better if we could say these 12 projects are good to go the second that you can actually provide the match we can get you know four times the money from the federal government that would be helpful as well that'd be perfect well jill let's talk about some collaboration here closer to home the uh in the northwestern you know end of pennsylvania and of course venango county um you know, it sounds like, yeah, having having all this information accessible when you reference, uh, you know, I think about eminent domain. We've been down that road before to, to build roads, to to pour lakes. You know, there have been any number of things. And man, some of those stories last for decades. Um, so, so much better to get cooperation up front and begin to build those relationships so that when we're ready, everyone knows the value of them. Jill, can you talk about what kind of collaboration we have and what we need to work on here at home? Sure, we've, we've had some really interesting projects that have taken place recently. Um, we always try to get the private sector in, you know, from, from the perspective of the public sector, the local development districts, we always say we do what the, the private sector can't or won't. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes they can't or won't. It's because the business model that exists doesn't give them the return on investment that they need to, to do the project. And, and that's nowhere, you know, nowhere is it more evident than in broadband development. So, you know, the goal is to create an environment, do some, some low cost efficient, uh, connectivity that will entice the private sector to come in and, and pick up that that project and run with it. So, you know, so what we try to do and, and one of the things, you know, we talk about barriers to, to funding. One of the things that we need to be very cognizant of when we're doing this is if we're using grant dollars to fund a project, the grant dollars can't go directly to the private sector. So so if we're working with uh, Mobilecom or USA Choice or, or um, you know, Windstream, who are all all fun um, internet service providers that we're talking to and engaged with at some level, um, they can't own the pro the the equipment. So the applicant, be it the Northwest Commission or the county, whomever that is, um, has to has to own it and then lease it back to those private sector individuals who are actually providing the service for us. So collaboration is incredibly important. Um, we do a lot of work with North Central Regional Planning, which is our local development district sister agency to our east, who's been an internet service provider for the last 20 plus years, because in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania, which is where they were, you know, where their office is located, there was no connectivity, there was no one there to provide, so they did it themselves. Um, and they've really kind of made that niche market and they're doing a lot of the fixed wireless in their region as well as here in our region, they're in Indiana County. They've really, they do a lot of work with, with Pennsylvania State Police and their towers as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of um, collaboration taking place within the LDDs, with the private sector, with other uh, service providers. So there, there is no magic bullet. You know, Sasha said it and I completely agree. There is no one way to get to end. And you have to be open to 
every opportunity that comes to you because no project looks like your last project or your next project. Yeah. Wow. Hey, I want to remind everyone, if you have questions, if this is bringing things up, throw them in the chat or be ready when, when we ask, if you want to, want to ask something, we have a couple more here that we're going to, we're going to go after, but then we'll, we'll try to open up the opportunity. If you have questions, um, let's talk about timing a little bit. So you've, you've kind of touched on that before, but, but how much of a role does timing play in successfully funding projects? Uh, Jill, do you want to address that a bit. Yeah, timing is everything. Um, and and as Sasha talked about, there's there's a lot of project, there's a lot of money floating around out there right now. And there's a lot of money that's going to come and be dispersed in a very short period of time. So, you know, when you talked about shovel ready and we've talked about match and we've talked about timing, all of those things are hand in hand with one another. And if you you know, you have to you you have to know what your projects are. You have to know what your capability of matching the dollars that are coming down are, and you also need to know the deadlines and the parameters of how quickly that money needs to be engaged. And you know, sometimes it's how how quickly does the money need drawn down? How much? Sometimes it's you need to not just spend the money. You know, not a paid invoice for a tower. That tower has to be literally in the ground, ready for for operation. So a lot of it has to do with um, understanding the guidelines of every one of the programs, and no two programs look alike. So making sure that you're aware of of what does it mean to spend the money, what does it mean to engage those types of things, and all of that plays the role in timing. And Jill, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I do have the question. Do you have one person dedicated just to broadband? Yes. Um, so <laughs> Caleb, Caleb Gillian um, joined our uh, organization last summer. And Caleb does a couple different things in our office. And because I like him too much, I haven't thrown him full head first, uh, but he's doing a lot of work with our individual counties and bringing him up to speed. So he will be our single point of contact, um, but I've, I've stayed engaged in this um, and, and we'll continue to do that, but Caleb is our point of contact. Good, good to know. So it does help to know that um, as we, a lot of the listeners or, or you know, participants on in today might have questions that we can maybe begin to filter kind of through to you and Caleb to, you know, it, especially if they're helpful. So Sasha, let's talk about timing with you. You know, always want to know is what, what Jill's talking about, you know, kind of consistent everywhere, anything you have to add. Yeah, I mean, we, we are already late to the dance. Uh, you know, th this is something that a lot of things are already in motion. Being late to the dance doesn't mean we, we don't get to enjoy it. We do. And if we get on things immediately, yeah, this this year in particular is a singular moment in broadband funding history, unprecedented yeah. in that regard. And, you know, I would say if you're thinking of this, um, I mean, now is the time to start executing on due diligence do, and looking for particular grant programs. A lot of folks are also, I think, a, a bit too timid in talking directly to the cognizant program officers of these programs. And so my recommendation is always, always, like 100% of the time, to be talking to an official at the agency that you're applying to. It's often the case that they can give you pointers that will save you many, many hours and aggravations uh, they'll be able to tell you right out the gate, like, yes, you should apply, or eh, it might be better if you looked over at this other program, which is there, the closest they'll ever say to, there's no way you're going to get this funding, right? And that will, too, also save you a lot of time. Um, but these kinds of endeavors are already, for the most part, underway. And then there's a big asterisk on that, which is that there's also this gigantic pending COVID stimulus bill that has tens of billions of dollars in broadband funding uh, sprinkled throughout it. The second that that passes, again, it's gonna open up a whole array of new programs. And um, what, I, what I can tell you is that these programs, there's some that are already off and running like RDOF and what have you. There's many others that are right now, they're figuring out what the rules of the road even are. 
So in that regard, you're no further behind than anyone else because the actual rules for eligibility or how to even go about applying haven't been written yet. Yeah. But that will shift over the next one to three months. And so what you're really looking at is wanting to be caught up to the point so that in spring, summer 2021, you're right at the front end of the queue in applying for funding from a bunch of the programs that are right now being operationalized. Great. Yeah, that is great advice. So the timing is get with it, right? <laughs> get prepared. You know, I know, um, while I have a little background in telecom, I just kind of really stepped in again. And it's intimidating, you know, when I'm trying to figure out even how to ask the questions. I, I think uh, broadband to some extent still feels a little like magic. Like, how does it really work? So it, it can be intimidating to know who to ask and, and, and the funding can be you know, really complicated. So on a funding question, um, is it enough? Do we have enough? Broadband is really big and you're talking, oh, you, you're talking don't have billions, is it enough? No way, it, it's a drop in the bucket in terms of what's needed. And anyone that has an honest assessment of the state of connectivity in this country knows that even after we drop the next hundred billion dollars into this, that will make a dent. I don't want to, you know, poo-poo that, but it is absolutely not enough, not even close to that. What I will say is that many of these programs have had earmarks for the administration of those programs. And that is not just like, oh, making sure the money goes to the right person. That is support for people that are applying which is to say, yeah, a lot of this stuff is black magic-y kind of, you know, like it's not clear how you're supposed to operationalize things, what the technologies even mean, all that. Like I'm in this sector and have been for the last quarter century. And sometimes I come across technologies. I'm like, what the heck is this? <laughs> yeah. But there are people at each of these programs often whose sole role is to help facilitate your applying, which is to say they have people that, sure, there's, there's somebody that's gonna sell you the exact same service for an arm and a leg, or you can get it from, for free from the people that are actually gonna make the decision whether to fund you or not. To me, it's a no brainer. And that conversation is often very easy to have. All you gotta do is pick up the phone or drop an email to the contact point for a lot of these federal programs. Great, Jill, any, any follow-up from you on that? No, I, I honestly, I couldn't agree more. I'm sitting here as he, as, as Sasha's saying that, I'm thinking, you know, when I was a, a private or public sector lender at North Central, I used to joke that uh, nothing made me more, more nervous when I talked to a business when I said, how much do you need? And they say, how much can you give me? Um, that's exactly where we're at with broadband. There is no number big enough. Um, there is so much work to be done and there's so many places. And you talked about, you know, the river communities that we have in Northwest Pennsylvania. We have a lot of them, but there are places that are never going to be funded. There are never going to be connected because it would cost too much to get it there. Technology doesn't allow you, topography doesn't allow you to get there. So, um, you know, if you had a blank check, we could connect everyone, but there's not enough time and money out there that's going to get us fully covered 100%. Well, and considering that Sasha has, has promised me before, I maybe promise is a strong word, but encouraged me that there will be a day somewhere, hopefully sooner than later, where internet will flow like water. <laughs> um, it means that we've, we've really got to be investing in, in interesting alternative solutions. Um, you know, SpaceX is one, uh, we're, we're not going to talk a lot about providers today, but we, we hope to, we're anyone that has connections to providers, we want to invite providers to a round table, but we've got to be looking at those interesting, different solutions to get internet everywhere, right? Sasha, you unmuted, I bet you have something to say. <laughs> well, I, I, to me, it's obvious that as a critical resource, we need to make a a commitment as a civil society to providing this critical resource to everyone in America. Like, it, you know, we've done the same with electricity, with roads, with primary education. We're hopefully going to get there with things like healthcare and, you know, like, but this resource undergirds all of that. Mm -hmm. 
And the fact that we don't yet have a federal plan, much less a state plan, and unfortunately, even at the local level, often there's no local plan for the provisioning of this critical resource is driving an enormous opportunity cost, which is to say, we, we do have to make a major investment. We have to make an investment far larger than what we've made today. On the other hand, our failure to make that investment is going to cost us a lot more over time, whether it's in poor educational or health outcomes, whether it's in economic activity that can't take place, whether it's in, you know, in essence, housing prices going down or, you know, crimes of desperation going up because people don't have jobs and et cetera. Like this feeds on itself in both directions, a positive trajectory where we've provisioned broadband and people have the ability to participate fully in a 21st century digital economy and a negative trajectory, which is everything that happens when we have a digital divide and don't address those that have not been adequately served. Either of those trajectories is possible at this point for many communities which is to say many of the areas that are least served, and trust me, I've spent the last 15 years working with tribal authorities, and as bad as it is in rural America writ large, man, I'll, it's a lot easier to work there than in some of the communities that we've been deploying 21st century high-speed telecommunications infrastructure. Like, it's possible in some of those locations, it's possible pretty much anywhere we would like to if, and this goes to Jill's point, if we adequately prioritize the expenditures that it would take. And some places are going to be damn expensive. There's no way around that. But such is true with putting roads or schools everywhere in the United States too. And we made a decision as a civil society that that infrastructure was crucial for everyone. And my argument is this one is very much as well. Yeah, connects us all. Jill, um, let's, let's have you start this. Uh, is funding the biggest barrier to a robust infrastructure of internet? I think it is in the sense that without it, nothing else matters. Um, but there are there are lots of, of barriers, and you know, um, one of them is is just being able to get through permit permitting is another big part of that. Um, willing participants, all of those things. But yeah, without money, nothing else matters. Yeah, Sasha, would you agree with that, or do you have a, another side to that coin? So I would say infinite funding is necessary but insufficient, <laughs> which is to say. Uh, I'm always amazed by our ability to piss away infinite money to bad solutions. And, and so I absolutely agree with Jill that this is the largest barrier, but without innovative thinking, without a competition policy, without a diversification of the business models and technologies being employed, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that money alone is our biggest issue. I feel it's like money plus a lack of competition plus regulatory capture, you know, and putting on my professor hat, you know, we talk about something called the political economy of this sector, which is to say these interrelationships between policymakers and major corporations have sucked up, have hoovered up unbelievable amounts of money for very little coming out the other side. And my fear is that we're heading into a new era also, whereby we're putting tons of money into very marginally effective solutions. The flip side of this is also that for local communities, I've been shocked by how those of us that have been working in this space for decades, often very lonely in working in these spaces for decades, uh, now that there's money on the table, every snake oil salesman you can possibly imagine is showing up. Yeah. And so for folks that don't know this stuff cold, it's also a very fraught moment because a lot of these 
you know, folks that are just there for the money are not committed to the successful implementation of these projects and frankly are hoovering up money and delivering very little actionable or useful uh, uh, interventions. And that too is a major, major problem. Yeah. And it stems from the fact that we don't have a systemic state or national strategy for how to do this. And we've left it in many ways to the vagaries of markets that have been dysfunctional for decades to solve. And that, that has proven to be highly ineffective and is something that we'll be laboring under as we're trying to figure out how to solve the problems that we have now dug ourselves into. Yeah, I, I want to remind everyone about the chat. I'm keeping an eye up. As soon as I see anyone throw something in the chat or unmute, we'll, we'll start taking questions. Um, we, we've gotten through our prepared ones, but I'll add here um, that just, you know, coming off of this last year, which was, oh, I don't even want to use the, the words unprecedented <laughs> and such, um, it, it's really, really shown us that we have to be uh, quite innovative in how we approach things. Jill, I know you and I have been around the block a time or two, too, with some of these projects. And I, I, I think what, you know, one of the things I see in this last year is there are a lot of people coming up with new ideas, some that really need to be explored. So, you know, separating the snake oil salesman from people who have been moved to action this year is important. At the same time, um, you know, those of us who have been working really hard for decades to make change, you know, are challenged by the knowledge we we arrived at 2021 with um, and not wanting to get stuck into well, we've always done it this way, but still we need to tap into the wisdom of experience. You know, we, we kind of know when something is maybe not the best use of our time or resources. And, and, and yet then when it's appropriate to step into something that's a new idea can be a challenge. Jill, any thoughts on that? Do you find yourself uh, and and that, I think that, you know, we love working with lots of new, new people and new generations, people that move in from the area, but do you experience some of that challenge? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I keep using the phrase, what I know about broadband, you could put in a thimble, but I've got to quit. I've got to find something new because no one knows what a thimble is anymore because <laughs> we're working with all these youngsters. But, um, but you're absolutely right. And Sasha makes such a great point that, you know, the, the Northwest Commission and the local development districts, our our primary role is to be a convener of people and ideas, right? So what we know, we know really well. And what we don't know, we gather up those who do. I've, I've always said, you know, you, you can sum up my career in, in one phrase. It's, I don't know everything, but I know who does. It's bringing the right people together, making sure that you're tapping into the resources and wealth of knowledge that exists. Because I'll be the first to tell you, sometimes I sit in a room when we're talking about broadband and I'm overwhelmed by what I don't know. So I don't pretend to know what I don't know. Um, it's, it's bringing those people together. I didn't know Sasha before we had our first meeting just a, a few months ago. It's making sure that we're tapping into the resources that make the most sense, not talking to and not spending a lot of energy and resources on those who are just looking, you know, they're, they're, they're chasing revenue. Um, it's, hey, there's a grant out there for this. Why don't we go after it? Well, do you know anything about it? Well, no, but we'll learn. No, this isn't something that you cut your teeth on. This isn't something that you learn while you go. It's making sure that we have the right people at the table and, and, and kind of, you know, wheat to chaff and, and making sure that at the end of the day, we have a product. I mean, we are, we are the stewards of public sector money, of taxpayer money. We better be doing it right. And we can't get it wrong or we can't get it very wrong because you don't get that second chance. Well, um, again, uh, invite questions, but as we kind of start to wind down, I wanna invite each of you to, to help me with a little bit of a wrap up here. Um, what, what can we leave people with in terms of um, you know, takeaways as we look to empower everyone that's with us today and those who hopefully will, will listen to today uh, you know, after the fact or re-listen today, what are the things that, that anybody and everyone can do to, um, to, you know, to learn about funding and, and connect the communities that they're a part of to those opportunities? Jill, I'll let you start and then Sasha, maybe you can follow up. 
Sure, and 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 you know the group that's that's here today. Your to your point are are those who can be engaged. One of the things that's come out of 2020 is almost every, if not every county now has some kind of task force, some kind of focus group, and broadband is a part of that conversation. The Northwest Commission, we we have for the last probably four years had a broadband task force that represents that is represented by all eight of our counties. Get involved, ask the questions. Um, at the local level, and and you know, I think we talked about this a little bit, but when we talk about federal dollars and we're going after dollars, um, municipalities are nice, counties are great, regional projects. The more bang for your buck, the more impact, the more jobs created, jobs retained, residents served that you can put into a, an application, the better off you are. So, um, you know, internet does not know county lines, state lines, you know. So, making sure that you're getting engaged at the local level, which creates more impact at the regional level, which brings more dollars to the region. Yeah, great point on, you know, just adding to that collaboration. And as I've heard it say, you know, we, it shouldn't be about us each getting a bigger piece of the pie. Let's make the pie bigger so there's more for everyone. So as we work collaboratively, we can make that happen. Sasha, what do you have to tell us? Yeah, I mean, the hardest part right now is just getting folks to jump on these opportunities that are all around us. It, it's you know, I'm thinking to like the, the paycheck protection program. And I, I sit on a few other boards of small nonprofits. And I'm just like, we need to apply for this. And like, I haven't ever heard of this. I'm like, doesn't matter. Just, just get the applicant. And, and each entity that does this has raised tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars of de facto free money. And then I think about how many small NGOs just never apply and left money on the table that they were pretty much guaranteed to get. And that's what, when I'm looking at these programs, it feels very similar, that there is so much money floating around and crammed into such a small allocation window that even though these programs are usually highly contentious, because they have to spend down money, it's basically gonna be like everyone applying is getting something, right? So like you get the application in, and you have a amazingly high probability of getting funded at this point. And that will be over in six months. And so that's really what we're looking at is this moment in time where massive money for dream projects is available if people just jump on it. And it doesn't matter if you don't know what you're doing today because actually, once you get into demystification, you find out this isn't very difficult, but there's a lot of resources available, free resources, that'll help get you the minimal necessary to be eligible. And then beyond that, the agencies themselves will work with you to you know, refine and correct as needed. But in many ways, it's a weird thing where the funder needs you in some ways more than you need them. They have a statutory mandate, they must spend this money. And so they're gonna, they're gonna figure out a way to spend it. Yeah, great, great. Thank you for the encouragement, Sasha. I, we've watched the same thing. I've, you know, certainly many of you have heard me say, I'm so, so proud of our business community. You know, our membership is made up of primarily small businesses and I've watched them survive the last year and largely because they were proactive enough um, to, to go tap into the resources available for them. And some were very reluctant at first, you know, well, what, what makes me eligible? But as we encourage them, we need you to still be in business at the end of this. And we trust that you'll reinvest that money with your employees, with local vendors. I think it's the same way with broadband. It's all very, very much the same. So, um, you know, we, we, we trust that most people are doing the right thing. We want to encourage them. Um, I guess we've covered all the possible questions because we haven't had anyone suggest anything else. We know that you'll have questions. We assume that as you ponder what Jill and Sasha and I have talked about today, there may be things you wanna know. I've mentioned before, we can certainly add more of these broadband connection meetings. If anyone is interested, you just let me know what we need to focus on. Our goal is within the next few weeks to a month to schedule 
a broadband provider roundtable. So I do need your help, everyone, with connecting me with the broadband providers that you know um, that are prepared to meet up with us. Some have reached out to me already. We're excited to include you, but we're, um, you know, this is an issue that's not going to go away. So we want to stay, you know, really involved in broadband. Uh, as a chamber, we are also collaborators, conveners. So we love working with Jill and doing that, uh, in our case, on a more focused, you know, Venango area, um, you know, region. So in conclusion, I, I want to thank Jill and Sasha. They've been great about being so responsive and giving us a, their time today and in the past. I always want to thank our members. The Venango Chamber members are those who provide uh, my staff and I the ability to bring this kind of uh, information to you, we, we think is really valuable. You can visit uh, venangochamber.org slash broadband for follow-up. You can view previous recordings. And of course, on our website, you, you will know how to contact us. We always share also, I think Sasha and Jill would welcome you reaching out to them if there's something that they can help you with. Um, so thank you for joining us. We'll uh, just keep an eye on our events and our emails, and we'll let you know when we prepare for the provider roundtable. And with that, I uh, thank you for joining us today. Stay safe, stay connected. Until next time.